Margarita Novikova and Elena Mikhailovsky. Sorry, I somehow didn't see you <laughs> suddenly. So um, uh, they both will tell about their uh, project Put Yourself. Put yourself. And uh, well, uh, the way um, how we got to, to know about you, actually it was a uh, really an accident. Uh, so Margarita just walked into the office and we had a really nice conversation and then I was telling that we are going to open the archive exhibition soon and uh, Margarita said, yeah, but we have a great project about archives. And so, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here you go. Um, Margarita Novikova. I'd like to say first uh, thank you for inviting us and uh, for the brilliant programming because we're sitting here and we wanted to keep Dorian and Nashan on these sofas and continue the conversations and all of us joined because and uh, what we heard in the morning also resonates with us strongly so we'll uh, pick on the themes and um, go um, into our personal story. Um, would you like to continue or how are we going to do it? Uh, maybe we'll show you, well, basically, uh, this April we have an anniversary. It's been five years that Margarita and I have been collecting uh, oral history archives and classical forms of archives to sort of back it up, or um, actually there is a me meaning to it, I'll explain it later, about the three days in August of 1991 when the Soviet coup d'etat happened and failed and de facto uh, caused the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, basically, I was uh, a child on the brink of teenagehood when it happened, and uh, I was in Vladivostok by the far east end of Russia, and it was a closed military city, and what I can remember was that the grown-ups were concerned. But what about our military ships and submarines? What if they don't get anything from Kremlin and any coherence? They'll go and attack Japan or someone else, you know, what's going to happen? And then it, nothing happened to that extent, and uh, so, um, so I always thought, you know, what did happen after all? Was it really a second Russian revolution? Because the results are not clear, and uh, as the guys before us were saying, we do live in this uh, non-linear narrative society that's uh, been partially created for us and partially created by us. Um, so that's how I approached Margarita with this idea, and uh, she and took it uh, on. <laughs> and we, and uh, uh, we started to record uh, private memories of people who took part in these days, uh, in uh, this uh, coup d'etat. They were viewers, they were what? Witness, they were. Uh, in Moscow, they were in St. Petersburg. Or they, they simply existed Siberia, and aware of it. <laughs> in the, even in Latvia. And uh, we have more than 50 records. And uh, as we uh, collected them, or recorded them, we realized that uh, it's a very emotional topic. The topic is very emotional, and people have a lot of feelings about these days in Russia extremely in Russia, because uh, in Latvia it was absolutely different situation, uh, in Vilnius it was absolutely different situation, but for people in Russia who, was, who stand it for democracy or who was not happy about that, they all uh, have great emotions and uh, all interviews were I don't know, very enthusiastic about talking about this topic. Uh, I have to point out, regardless whether they approved or disapproved of it, basically it's still boiling. And, uh, but it wasn't easy to get to those emotions at first, because we would um, come and, you know, you can't just put a camera, and we were trying to film with all devices we had. Margarita at some point said, I'm going to film them with my finger. You know, I really want to know. We, we wanted, because we were getting um, this into this ecstatic, State every time we recorded the interview because we could see there is a history palpating in these um, collections. Uh, so we'd sit them down and say, okay, um, can you remember yourself on August 19, 1991? What you did then? Yeah, what did you do? But at first they would launch into this, uh, but the Imperius Troika, but you know, I lost this, I lost that. Gorbachev, so they would, Gorbachev Yeltsin, you know, hate them all. Uh, you know, what did it come to? I said, okay, calm down, calm down, just you, 
morning. Tea or coffee? Did you have tea or coffee on August 19th? And that's how sort of layer by layer they got began peeling these sort of uh, years of television and media that followed after and what they lived through and what they thought they lived through. Um, so, you know, their own narratives, they imported outside narratives by guys like Vladislav Surkov. And uh, it got to something true. And that's why every time we record it, we produce some sort of emotion. And we're pretty ecstatic about it. Yeah. <laughs> and we are not planning to uh, work with this project during five years. Yeah. We, we just wanted to, to do something about the, not about, about the event uh, in the year of its 20th anniversary. It was a, uh, what? 2011. No. Yeah, it was 2011. 2011. Uh, but we didn't find our answers, and we, and we had to find them. It it became you know really desperate. We we didn't even know what it is because you know was yeah, there a revolution and, and or the wasn't it? We, or we, what we, was didn't, it? we didn't understand why we are so excited about this event. Yes, I come from a documentary background, so I'm not an artist, and Margarita is the video artist. Um, so, but it's. Um, so, actually, we've got into this unhealthy relationship with what we were collecting. Along the way, um, the actual archival documents began to turn up, because once you start looking for something, it starts coming to you. So we've inherited uh, these papers from the white Russian Moscow White House, the government building where Yeltsin was um, um, going against the, the communist hardliners and uh, you know the papers of the day, the, the papers which were censored but they still came out, so that's something with the handwriting, we were looking for all this kind of really human emotion and you know trying to, <laughs> can we get something out of archive because we thought you know archive is about truth, art is about truth, so they have to be matched and we'll, we'll come out with something, uh, with a product out of it. So we, in the year 2011 we produced two few first things. One was a um, uh, sort of oral history documentary animation um, uh, about the events. Uh, and if you, would like, you can if you would like, we can show a little bit of it. Um, Some historical digest. Yeah, yeah. This was the first we, very naive product. Um, Maybe a part of it. It's five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Стояли танки, сидели в них наши ровесники, которые тоже не очень понимали, что они делают в центре Москвы. Я помню, как мы, купивши какое-то количество мороженого, угощали этим мороженым танкистов. Они были достаточно немножко злые, потому что их привезти привезли, а покормить забыли. Было утро. So anyway, as you can see, we're quite playful uh, about it, and um, uh, it was a precursor for a bigger kind of interactive um, system that we were working on, and uh, we weren't making it for the August 2011, and uh, so it was displayed in Moscow Art Play um, in January 2012. That's after the new kind of way of protests that yeah, Art of Memory exhibition. Uh, this came at, um, after the uh, Balotne protests and the, the new kind of uprising. Yeah, before, before the Balotne and the new sort of uprising um, in the Russian society that was sort of becoming, become, beginning to form. Um, so we um, basically we, we were seeing things differently, and I'm trying to. Yeah. We were close to become enthusiastic again about <laughs> new revolutions. Yeah, uh, but then at that exhibition, that very exhibition, we, um, we saw these barricades built by students, especially, you know, for this especially for this exhibition, but they had this massive notice on them saying, this is not to incite uh, public action against the government or something to that extent. So basically, where they, they had almost like a legal written note. I'm not protesting. I'm not protesting. I'm just remembering. It's just an object. Yeah, it's just an object you know, I'm, I'm really not for it. And uh, we felt that uh, we have a mission now because we have all this material that still breathes of revolution, and uh, there are these generations of students. And you think students are the most radical people <laughs> in the society? 
just because they're young and, and don't have families and mortgages. And um, so, uh, and they don't protest or they don't even know how it was because uh, in the 20 years, um, it's not like it's not in uh, history books, but it's about that long. And finally enough, the event that sort of ended the whole era is not uh, described or analyzed properly. It's just, you know, it's just a hot kitchen debate, uh, basically. Yes, but let's start. <laughs> we'll, we'd like to show you uh, what the, the product, the, the, what the, latest, uh, the latest product, the, the last version of Put Yourself uh, uh, as a collection of uh, oral histories uh, with uh, some printed and photo documents. And uh, for us, uh, after five years, it, uh, it became mm, a method, a, a method, an apparatus to understand uh, why we started it. Uh, but this version, <laughs> this version is still a digital museum, so-called digital museum version. Uh, we'll, after this little bit of um, preview, we'll talk uh, to you why, um, uh, why we are moving from it. Было утро, меня разбудил папа и сказал, что пиздец Горбачеву. Just to a little bit explain how we structured the, the so-called digital museum is uh, that uh, there is a narrative of interview excerpts and if you just don't press anything you will get it. You can just watch it, like, you know, sit back, get a cup of coffee and um, uh, while they're describing the same, same events there is a narrative that we keep in and it's uh, how we saw them. Um, at, that moment, at that moment when we were putting it together and um, as a support sort of uh, this is just the, the kind of knowledge base you can delve into the um, uh, digitalized version of the paper archives that we have inherited like for example the this newspaper uh, sadly this one is not translated but we um, uh, we are getting them gradually translated, and so or you can make links to the people they've, um, that were mentioned, like the Victor Mizian. I remember the tanks that were sent by the people behind the putsch and how they changed sides to support the White House. They roared threateningly down the asphalt. They moved with a metallic scraping sound and directly at us. It was. Uh, we also, uh, because once we accumulated this um, sort of these interviews, we uh, started categorizing them first, you know, by obviously geography. Um, then we saw um, that, um, for example, seven percent of people were mistaken 1991 for 1993. You know, they kind of the, the tanks in Moscow and the White House—they don't merge in their head. They, they're no longer 
uh, could distinguish, uh, or uh, I don't know, thirty percent of people were talking about food. You know, they were talking about events, but the food was coming in because they were hungry. Yes, and you could really uh, get, you know, it was as if you were looking through the looking glass into 1991. Um, so we were trying to structure using keywords, and then um, when Margarita was attending the protests in Moscow and she encountered all these young people, she realized that they know nothing about their own history, which is not, you know, this is not 18th century, uh, <laughs> this was <laughs> not so long ago. Um, so we put together this version with the kind of educational and the activist um, aim in mind. But we still haven't solved our internal questions. That's why we carried on. You know, we didn't show you the, the version in between that we had, but, uh, because we, we continued. Something wasn't right. You know, and it was not a paid job. <laughs> yeah, it was not a paid job. At, at the beginning, we were supported by the Yeltsin uh, Center in Moscow, um, and um, but after that, we had to go because we, we still had something unanswered. It was unstoppable. And I think this year is the final year where we are actually getting some answers and uh, they will come out. Um, uh, one exhibition in September and one maybe sound exhibition, sound. another, yeah, possibly two exhibitions in uh, September, but we finally um, understood what we really found as what I think. You know, shall we tell it? <laughs> <laughs> Our secret news. <laughs> we realized that uh, our interviewees who were on the democratic side and uh, we liked them very much and we had the same feelings and they were our heroes and we believed that they were close to make a real revolution but something went wrong and uh, they they were so emotional and they had uh, emotional relationships with authority with power basically they continued following the old russian pattern of uh, either loving or hating uh, your person in power above you and not um, sort of judging them objectively as if they're a you know, telephone company, they have to fulfill the duty and you, you replace them if they're not working well, you know, it has to be a love or hate because all of them uh, professed uh, real love, uh, exaltic love for Yeltsin at the time so obviously they have delegated all their civil power while they were sort of doing a good cause, and um, I still believe you know they, they did the right uh, they did the right thing. There was no way that um, you know the, the the guys who instigated the coup should have won, <coughs> but they have um, they were infantile, and that, thus you know to us this revolution that we were so obsessed about we don't think it happened anymore. You know, okay, we don't have so many statues of Lenin. Um, and you know different money and poor and rich people, but um, the society yeah, the is structure. still in that matrix. You know they, they yeah, the been, structure of the um, country and the state is absolutely the same. We just changed the screen. It was a communist screen, and now I don't know how to call it. Well, different Putinist screen. <laughs> <laughs> sort no, of so, so the uh, this uh, oral history archive. Well, it came from looking into the archive and looking a lot. And, and, and although we've sort of um, heard these interviews many times, you know, when we're editing them, these are only excerpts. Uh, from excerpts, you can go to longer interviews, you can really delve. And, uh, and we thought, you know, there is a real sort of, a, although very fragile, but the truth in oral history, because it's, uh, um, you know, it, it's, not, um, it's not been through this, kind of meals of ideology and uh, by collecting a big amount of it, you know, you will get a real picture gradually, uh, sooner or later. But uh, when we started working on uh, this idea of a sound um, exhibition, just sound, no, no videos, um, and that's when we realized that this is what happening, <laughs> what was happening with all of them. So even people who um, uh, said, you know, oh, I was very objective of Boris Yeltsin, but in those three days, I absolutely loved him, um, and you know they have um, they have done it once again. So. <laughs>
So, so anyway, so I think this, this year, um, um, as, we, as I mentioned, we will do two exhibitions and we're still um, uh, going to organize and I think we will hand the archive over. Um, Let him go. And, uh, and, and by the way, um, the previous speakers, they told about uh, opportunity or what to shape a collective memory mm -hmm. and, uh, we, we, this and maybe this this uh, this uh, sort of archive is against shaping of collective memory because of the option your putsch does it work yeah, yeah you, you can uh, so you can join and um, you, if you have records, your private uh, memory uh, well, you can you can join uh, the project and you can uh, record yourself with your webcam. And, well, basically we're hoping that it will have a life of its own. I mean, it, it will be a base and it will continue going, growing, but um, we're no longer so emotionally attached to it and we've kind of <laughs> realized um, uh, we've answered our own questions and um, uh, here are some of, some of the characters. and. Um, uh, I don't know, as a, uh, maybe, maybe I'll get her. I served on the team of our first head of state, Anatoly Gorbunov. He was the head of the Supreme Council of the Republic of Latvia after the country's declaration of independence from 1990 to 1993. I was his personal translator and advisor on foreign affairs. The August Putsch created the historical background that opened up a slot for Latvia to slip through to freedom. From 1990, we had a period of transformation because from the 4th of May, 1990, Latvia declared its independence. It was declared by a legally elected parliament, the Supreme Council. But our independence was not acknowledged by the Soviet Union headed by Gorbachev, nor by Western governments. I have very interesting personal memories that were associated with my job at the time. First of all, on August 19th, my vacation was to have ended. On Saturday, the 17th of August, we were returning on the ferry and we spent the night in an onboard cabin. I had this dream, a very significant one. It was as though I was back to work on Monday and I worked in the parliament building on the third floor where the entire presidium was located. There was the secretary's desk, and to the right was the office of the representative, Anatoly Gorbunov. My place was to the left. In other words, I was very close to the center of power, with just the secretary between us. In my dream, I see how on Monday I enter the reception area where the secretary sits, and I want to pass through to my office. But the secretary, who's sitting very strangely with her back abnormally straight, looks at me and says, you see, our situation has changed. I look through the open door into my office and see that my papers are gone from my desk. I enter my office and see that Johansson, the personal assistant to the head of the KGB, which still existed back then, is sitting at my desk. I was acquainted with him. In January of 1991, after a shooting incident, I accompanied a correspondent from the New York Times as a translator. Together we visited Rubik's because it was thought that he was involved in the shooting. We also visited the head of the KGB, and that same assistant met us then. He only spoke Russian, and you can tell that he was sent from Moscow. We thought then that he was in charge of the whole KGB here, that he was really the guy in charge, not Johansson. He wasn't in uniform, but he wore a shirt with epaulets. In my dream, I enter the office and that same person is sitting at my desk and he says to me, you are relieved of your duties. You no longer work here. We have taken over power now. Um, so, um, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of uh, really human details in the oral history um, interviews, as I mentioned, as food, as um, life, you know, and we, we found out that a lot of people, because of uh, August coup, uh, either wanted to get married urgently or divorce, <laughs> because something was changing drastically in their life. So, you know, they still still, still were humans, and um, you saw an interview by, um, of uh, Karina Petrsoni, and uh, 
this is one of the, although she talked about dream, and, but she's very, she's in a happy place. Yeah? She, she's not uh, sort of um, either um, putting on this farcical expression as a lot of um, um, intelligentsia interviewees in Moscow or in Russia did because I think they, they feel that they haven't finished their job or something else. They have this kind of a jokingly attitude. Yes, I was serious back then, but now I'm not, you know, I don't know what to think about it. But um, anyway, uh, we feel that um, it's been an extraordinary uh, emotional journey for both of us. Uh, I didn't uh, bug in for it <laughs> at all when we started five years ago. You know, I just thought, you know, let's do a web doc and that, that'll be good. And uh, it came to something else and we, we were sort of got, uh, buried in archives. And um, uh, so, so anyway, because the previous guys, they touched on so many points that we um, also share. So I think maybe it's a good idea to start Q&A. What do you think? Yes, I think so too. Uh, I will uh, ask maybe the first two small questions uh, just to uh, clarify a little bit because I'm interested in how do you choose the, the people to interview because you come more from the art or documentary cinema world and would, and is that somehow influencing the, the range of people? Or, and the second one is like when people upload their, um, let's say, video, have you ever had a situation that you would like to you know, edit it or, or delete it or maybe you have actually done some editing or something. Okay, uh, well, um, we were trying to be objective, uh, but obviously the, the obvious choice were those who were in the live uh, kind of protective circle around the Moscow White House um, uh, because they were the direct participants, so we went to them first. And, um, uh, but we also, uh, for balance, I mean, we, we were trying to get geographic yeah, coverage, geographic, yeah, yeah, yeah. geographic coverage people. and through different layers of society, like these chaps, the carpenters, and... Um, there was not any particular reaction to all of the events at first. People reacted calmly. That is how they took it. People were used to changes in power as they had already experienced the time when all of the communist secretaries changed. Yeah, for example, you know, they're not alcoholics or low lives, they're just simple workers. Um, and uh, that's another thing that we actually discovered only by looking at this. From this interview, we were trying to find the document, not the other way around, um, that a lot of workers supported Boris Yeltsin. It's not true that they were sitting there, oh, let's have communism back or whatever. You know, they went on strike the day after. A lot of miners went uh, in Siberia on strike. Um, and like this document, sadly still in Russian, <laughs> um, gives some sort of statistical overview of that. Um, you know, the box box they did um, on the day. And um, so we did discover a lot about our own history, which we couldn't do any other way and it's still I don't think I believe it's still impossible to get them more objective than this <laughs> but about this event only and uh, uh, as I think these days these guys these guys are the more practical and the practically thinking in compar in comparison with all Democrats they are not thinking with love about um, power they think if they have to eat or not tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. It's well, we came to the conclusion way. that the Russians should strip all emotions and try to be cool <laughs> for think change about and, food. Uh, and grow up, you know, simply grow up because, you know, there was a lot of uh, infantilism um, that came through in these interviews and, um, and they look very childish. Uh, still, After, for example, Victor Mizian talk in this uh, interview or something else from some journalist, but are very practical. Yeah, these they guys, sound, yeah, they compared to them, they, they do. Then we also discovered some uh, interesting details, like uh, CIA knew about it. Uh, there is a journalist um, who, um, in the 90s, he, he was, uh, Andrea Stalski, he was head of um, BBC Russian service in London. Yes, he, he was living in London. Uh, basically, somewhere on here, he, um, he was working for Radio uh, Liberty, uh, part-time, he, he was 
writing for another, I think it's Vestia was the newspaper he was writing on, and on 15th of August they called him and asked, said, you know, write down these telephone numbers just in case something happens. And um, before the yeah, just just before the event, and um, um, uh, so basically they knew they 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 warned all the because Radio uh, Liberty used to be a part of the CA department no longer. Um, so so anyway, we've discovered this. <laughs> Uh, fascinating details which we um, could have, you know, in uh, not so many, you know, we could have trolled through a lot of books, but then we would take the interview and from that we would maybe look for document um, as an old habit of wanting a document to confirm, you know, as if a paper is more important than the person. But <laughs> that's, what, that's, you know, we're also, so a why we yeah? also have a matrix, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I think uh, I wanted to ask, do you have plans to go on uh, with other periods uh, of, of history? Because I think what's going on nowadays, especially also in Russia, that there's this demonization of the 90s, that it's kind of like seen as a as an age of uh, uh, organized criminal, criminals and, and Krisha and all these kind of poverty and how hard it was. And on the other hand, all those kind of mm, almost anarchistic art movements or, or, or initiatives from like civil in, initiatives were so possible because there was no regime, also I mean, so in the European Union, so was, uh, or in Latvia, before European Union, there were no uh, concrete schemes how society functions. So there were loads of those loops, just as we loopholes, just as we got our independence, there were loopholes for independent actions through the 90s. Um, do you have interest in, in, yeah, in yes. other periods? And, Push or revolution? Yeah, of course we do. <laughs> of, course, of course, yes, because now we have some experience and uh, we know how to make a platform for that. So we can uh, arrange a museum of every event. We know how to do it, or, or just a small event. For example, about this one, we can uh, interview everyone and ask what was interesting for you, what you were thinking about, how many photos, how many selfies you did, and uh, organize it in some way, and it will be your online interactive museum of the symposium. So we can... Uh, Basically, yeah, uh, we want to create this platform uh, and call it, um, you know, Be Heard Museum. To, to give voice people and to enable them um, uh, to turn their cell phones not onto themselves as a selfie but record it and through app share it and upload to this platform easily you know it has to be all integrated without going into too many details and create mini museums of different oral histories you know related to certain events um, and uh, with views that um, uh, maybe artists or documentary filmmakers or writers, they could come and help them to work with that material and create narratives because to, you, know, you can't consume hours and hours of interviews, you still need some sort of a narrative um, out of it. So, but these are very um, uh, fresh ideas. And, uh, but I know, I know I'll be doing it like um, I did um, a documentary in Ingushetia um, and I was adamant it had to be in English language and uh, with my uh, partner on the film uh, we wanted something so light, light hearted, almost mythical, but we came against this stumbling block that all the people, all they could remember was the forced migration uh, by Stalin. Uh, so <laughs> we ended up recording quite a lot of that and uh, um, creating narrative. Within the, there's some sort of truth in the oral history and in the way how it, it's imperfect, it's really imperfect, and you have to get to the layer of the years that have passed. You have to put people in a certain mode you know, like like we were saying, you know, what did you do? You remember, did you turn on the radio or was it TV? Did someone call? And then they started sort of walking back to their true selves. So, you know, we've got some plans, uh, but for this one, I think we've um, arrived at a good uh, place and we'll uh, reshape it. So, 
um, make it all in dual language and um, hopefully we'll find a permanent home for it. Uh, I have a feeling that I still need to ask another question, even though we're running a little bit out of time. Because you mentioned twice, I think, that there is a certain kind of truth in the oral history. And for example, even though I, I really appreciate uh, the project, and, uh, and I think also Exan and uh, Dorian mentioned that oral history is a way, for example, to record something that is not uh, recorded by the official archives and to represent minorities or, or excluded. And I think I, I also really believe that it is like that. But then also that if you say that there is this truth in this oral history, then that makes me doubt it a little bit because I have a feeling that when you deal with memories, then they actually change through time. And I was thinking, what what is your position towards that when you are working with this archive? Uh, yes, as I said, one one way is uh, to try to get as close as possible to inner self, and the other way is the mass. You know, if you can accumulate sort of statistically quite a lot, then hopefully you will get, um, you will deduce some truth, but um, then we'll get into this kind of metaphysical conversation about what the truth is, <laughs> um, really is. And for us, the truth, the finding truth that we found it was that there was no revolution, it was imaginary. Uh, we think so anyway. Um, although there was, yeah, at that moment. Um, uh, so, so that's my answer. Do you have something to add? <laughs> sorry, I was sorry. So, um, do you want to answer? No? No? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. 